Quiet, please. Quiet, please. System presents Quiet Please, which is written and directed by Willis Cooper and features Ernest Chappell. Quiet Please for tonight is called Camera Obscura. I don't suppose you ever killed anybody, did you? I didn't think you had. Funny, though, you can't tell, you know. Murderers very seldom look like murderers, and... There's lots more of them around. You have any idea? I know a fellow, a little squinched up, wheezing gizmo. He's a carpenter. Lives on Berenda Street down in L.A. Murdered his wife's brother in 1928, and nobody ever had the faintest idea except the wife's brother. And the guy's doing fine. He thinks he's got away with it. Well, he'll find out. Like that woman in Alameda that killed her husband with that stuff you can buy at any drugstore and never have a clerk raise an eyebrow at you? No, there's no such thing as getting away with murder, friend. Believe me. And for my money, walking up the 13 steps and standing on a trap door with nine turns of a hangman's knot rubbing against your left ear, or sitting in a chair smelling burnt almonds with a lot of scared faces staring at you through a little window, or, or even the hot squad itself. Believe me, any of those legit ways of paying off for murder is pie compared to what you're going to get if you let it ride. You're sure you never killed anybody, huh? Well, you better be. I know. Believe me, I know. I killed Philip D. Vandevoort on September 29th, 1928. I was never arrested. I was never suspected. But, no, I'm not going to tell you how I killed him. I'm not running a school for murderers. And anyway, if you're planning on murdering somebody, you got your own ideas on how you want to do it. The only thing is, I bet you quarter when you get done listening to me, you'll change your mind. You see. The man said he was going to call my story Camera Obscura. I suppose maybe that puzzles you a little bit. Not everybody knows what a Camera Obscura is, but practically everybody here in Santa Monica knows. The biggest Camera Obscura in the world's right here, down at the foot of Santa Monica Boulevard in the little park that runs along the top of the Palisades. It's a little green building, probably 20 feet high, practically circular, maybe 20 feet in diameter. And up on the top, in a little kind of cupola, is a lens, like a camera lens, only bigger. And some kind of mirror arrangement in there with it, and there's a big round table that almost fills the building, white top on it, and the image the lens picks up is reflected down under the table, so it's... Uh, like a technicolor movie of whatever's going on outside. There's a wheel, like a ship steering wheel that you turn to you know, turn the lens with it, turn it around so you can point it out towards the bay or up the street or anywhere. That's a cute little gizmo. Tourists have been getting a kick out of it for I don't know how many years. Ask anybody that's ever been in Santa Monica. Everybody's seen it, and an awful lot of people have been in it. And that's the camera obscura, a harmless little green building in a park in the sunshine, and black as a murderer's heart inside. And a miniature world lying flat on a table in there. Go see it sometime. You'll get a bang out of it, too. Even if you don't see what I saw. <laughs> There was this girl that worked in Llewellyn's restaurant next door to Harry Collins' bargain store where I worked. Now I've forgotten her name, Kate or Mary or Joanne or something, just to show you. That morning, I went next door for a cup of what Llewellyn claims is coffee. Nobody in there but this girl, this waitress, Mary or Kate or whatever her name was. She'd been crying. I said, what's the matter with you, kid? Nothing. Give me a cup of coffee. What's the matter, kid? Oh, nothing. Sigh. 
You seem so abandoned what the last couple of days. I looked up at her, and the tears started out of her eyes again, and I said, and I was telling the truth, I said, not since night before last. Why, I said. Where'd you see him? Why, down to the P.E. station down the street. What's the matter? Did he run out on you? What do you mean? Did he? He's gone. You sure? I knew it when I gave him the money. I knew it. I knew it. What did you do? Did you give him money? Oh, sorry, don't tell anybody, will you? Please don't. Well, I won't, but... He said he needed $200 to pay a man for something, and the, the banks were closed, and he couldn't get any money, and he needed it so bad. You mean you gave him 200 bucks? I borrowed it from Llewellyn. I told him I'd give it back to him in the morning. I had two hundred and forty dollars I saved up, and oh, sorry, what am I going to do? Wait a minute, wait a minute! I said. So this was where the money came from. Well, wait a minute! I said. You mean you borrowed two hundred bucks from the woman to give to Phil, and now he's gone, and you got to dig it yourself? Saved and saved and saved, sorry. And now I well, ain't that fine. <laughs> ain't that fine. How come you did it? Couldn't he have borrowed it from somebody else, for God's sakes? He... He... We was going to get married, Si. Well, you sap. Two hundred bucks, you sap. I know it, I know it. But what am I going to do? Well, I guess pay up. You said anything to the police? Oh, no. You going to? I don't know. Should I? No, I can't. Why not? Well, I don't know if he really ran out on me, but... You were going to marry him, huh? He asked me to. Yeah. Well... Uncle oh, Si, don't say anything about it to anybody, will you? No, I won't Please. say anything. I won't say anything. If, if he's really gone... He's gone, all right. What should I do? Well, you can go to the cops if you want to, but, but if I was you, you'd get an awful lot of publicity, you know. That worth 200 bucks to you? I know what. I don't know what to do. Well, I gotta beat it. Harry will be screaming for me. Here, you got change for a $10 bill? Yeah, I guess so. Oh, 10. 50. 2. 3, 4, 5, 5, 10. See what I mean? She didn't have the faintest idea that that was one of the ten dollar bills she gave to Phil Vandiver a couple of nights ago. Isn't it amazing? I should have thought she'd notice how wrinkled and damp the bill was from the salt water. You see, I didn't think about going through his pockets till after I took him out there under Santa Monica Pier and fastened him to one of the pilings down deep. It was a good place, I thought. Nobody ever goes out there. Nobody but the barracuda and the flat, ugly stingrays with those rows of teeth like white needles. <laughs> kind of left the camera obscura sitting out there on the Palisades all by itself, didn't we? Now we'll get back there. I'll say we will. It was funny about Phil Vandervert. He was one of those fellas you see around town, you never get to know him. But you see him, and he's like a bus stop sign or one of the kids that sells the outlook and the express on the corner across the street from the California bank. You know, he's there, and you never notice him. Never notice him when he disappears, either. It's like that in California quite a lot. So Philip D. Vandervoort sort of faded out. And practically the only people in Santa Monica that thought about him was me and the babe in the Wellens restaurant. And she didn't know. I thought about him at all. Funny how a fella is. She never brought up the subject to Phil. I was the one that talked about him. And she... Well, I guess she had been in love with him. There's something about being in a setup like this. A, a game, kind of playing it right up to the edge. Saying things that had... Give you away if she'd had the slightest inkling. Had a great kick. 
Yeah. A great kick. I remember one afternoon, I had Wednesday afternoons off, and that day I stopped in the restaurant, and she was putting on her hat. Llewellyn had told her her business was slack that day, and she could have the half day. So instead of eating a piece of pie, I said, come on, let's take a walk. Thought maybe we'd go down to the beach and take one of the trams over to Ocean Park and play tango, eat a couple of hot dogs. So we started down Broadway, and I said, hey, you ever been in that camera obscure over there? No, if you. No, let's go see what it is. Okay. It was one of those afternoons when the sun was still shining bright. There was a big bank of fog sitting offshore a few miles, sort of sneaking in to take over. Those afternoon fogs in Santa Monica are a thing. They slide in, and all of a sudden, it's like a great, big, damp, gray seagull sitting down on top of you. So I figured the fog would be in in another hour, and the beachfront is pretty dreary when that happens, so maybe we'd kill a little time in this gizmo and then walk on over to the Criterion and see the Rough Riders. That was what was playing then, the Rough Riders. There isn't anybody around the camera obscure when we climb up the steps. No tourists, nobody, just the girl and me, whatever her name was. The wooden door bangs behind us. I didn't know a place could be so dark. Well, we stood there and looked at the white top table and the moving picture of Santa Monica on it. I have to admit, it's quite a kick the first time you see it. But I hadn't seen anything yet. I twisted the wheel around, and the picture slid across the tabletop, and there were the breakers rolling in. There was La Monica Ballroom, and the merry-go-round on the pier, and people fishing, and people walking around, and I thought about what was under that pier, if it was still there. And then a man walked by real close, so he almost filled the whole picture. He turned, and he seemed to look right at us, up off that tabletop. Look! It fell! <laughs> And there he was, staring right at me and kind of smiling. And right behind him in the picture was the pier I left him under. And he stood there, and she fumbled at the door and threw it open, and the light flooded over the picture, and he was gone. Yes, and when I went outside, he was gone from there, too. But we saw him, Si. We both saw him. I don't know. I couldn't tell her it was impossible for Phil Vanderford to stand outside the camera obscura that afternoon, could I? I had to go along with her. I had to say, sure, you'll see him again. Sure, you'll get your $200 back. Sure, he'll show up again. Every time I said it, I got that chilly, cold seaweed feeling between my shoulder blades. I should have had sense then and gone up to Clarence Webb's office and turned myself in and said, Clarence, I murdered Phil Vandivert, and you'll find him tied to a piling under the pier out there just the other side of the dance hall. I should have done that. All they'd have done to me was send me up to Folsom and put the black cap on me. No, I had to do it the hard way. I had to get away with murder. I had the hunch and I didn't play it. I wish I had, that's all. Let's go over to the camera obscura again, Cy. I didn't want to go to the camera obscura again. I didn't want to go in there in the dark. I didn't want to see that picture. I didn't want to see Phil Vandervoort. This afternoon, the fog was already coming in. You couldn't see the end of the pier. And as you looked out toward the bay, that white wall kept easing in closer and closer. And I had the feeling that when it got to me, I'd disappear too. Right in broad daylight, you get that feeling. It was warm in there in the camera obscura from the sunshine that had been beating down on it all that long morning. Look at the fog, Di. Look, Di. In the fog in the picture swirled aside a little. There was somebody coming toward us. I had the illusion that he was actually coming toward us right out of the picture. And then the fog blew away a little more from his face. It's Phil. Look, Phil. I know we see him again. Phil. Phil. And she ran out of the place and the door slammed shut. I was all alone in there. She ran down the steps and I could see her in the picture and Phil came walking steadily toward me and and then I could see her in the picture. She ran toward him outside there, and I could hear her calling outside. And she ran toward him in the picture, and I could see them both just as plain as I see you. And she ran straight through him as if he was part of the fog himself, and he kept on coming closer toward me. Closer and closer. I don't know how I got out of there. I honestly don't know. 
I remember I couldn't find the door in the dark, and when I finally did get out, my hands were all full of splinters from pounding on the walls, and there was a gash over my eye where I fell down the stairs, and I've never been so scared in my life. I mean to say I had never been so scared in my life. You see, something tripped me as I opened the door. Something caught my ankle and threw me. No, it wasn't Phil Vanderbilt's hand, as you're probably thinking. It was a long strand of wet seaweed. The kind that gets all tangled around the pilings under the pier. I said I'll never go to that place again. I will never go to that place again. I'm going anyway. If you don't want to go, I'm going. I said don't go. Don't go. It's foolish to go to that place. There's some reason why Phil's hanging around that place, and I want to go there. I thought, I know why. I know why he's hanging around there. No, I won't go to the movies with you. Going over to the camera obscura, whether you want to go or not. And I knew I had to go. I said to myself... If you let that girl go over there by herself, she'll see him again, and what'll she find out? I said to myself, you got to go with her so you, you can keep her from finding out whatever she might find out. And I said, well, all right, I'll go just this one time. There wasn't any fog this time. It was a beautiful, bright day. There was just the two of us, or I should say the three of us. Yeah, we saw him again. This time was the payoff, as far as she was concerned. Oh, I'll tell you about it. There wasn't anything wrong with the picture, as long as we had the lens aimed toward town. She turned the wheel slowly, and the picture flowed past on the table. Up northward, toward the Miramar Hotel, down Ocean Boulevard, with the palm trees in front of the little real estate offices. And then we were looking up Broadway, and I could see Harry Cowan walk out of the store and into Llewellyn's. Then the gas station came into view, and... We looked down Ocean Boulevard the other way and then the rustic fence at the edge of the Palisades and the spires of the dance hall on the pier swam across the board. And, and there was Phil leaning against a palm tree not 20 feet away, it seemed. There he is. And just as if he'd heard her, he looked up at us and grinned. He lifted his hand and beckoned. Again, I had that curious feeling that he was real. He was three-dimensional there in the picture. And she opened the door and went out. But she came right back in. Nobody there. I could have told her I knew it. There's nobody out there. But there he was on the table, grinning at us. And he said something. I could see his lips move. What did he say? I didn't hear anything. I'm going to look again. She opened the door. And Phil's lips moved again. And I could read his lips. Anybody could read that word. Try it sometime. He said, Murderer. There. And the little figure in the picture smiled again. And he raised his hand and pointed straight at me, and I could see his lips move again. <gasps> and I knew she had read his lips, too. He said it again. Murderer. Oh. Stop that. I saw what he said. I saw it. Now I know. Now I know why we can't see him out there. He's haunting you. You killed him. You him under the palm tree was the girl. Not much left of the story now. Oh, I should have gone then and confessed. 
It would have been easier. But, well, I knew nobody would ever find Phil. And I didn't want anybody to find her. They locked the place up at night, but the door came open easy. I didn't bring any light. It was three o'clock in the morning, and the fog was hanging from the sky like a wet velvet curtain. You couldn't see a streetlight a block away. I went in. I crumbled around under the table where I'd left her. She wasn't there. I found a paper of matches, finally. She wasn't there. You think you know what terror is? Well, don't let me tell you. I stood up at last, and the night was so still I could hear the foghorn from way up toward Point Doom. The fog, as I told you, was thickest. Well, I glanced at the table. There they were, the two of them. And there wasn't any fog in the picture. I couldn't mistake them. Phil and the girl. And together they raised their hands and they beckoned to me. I knew I couldn't move. But I opened the door. I went down the steps into the fog. There was just one tiny spark of hope in the back of my mind. Just one tiny spark. I knew they wouldn't be there. But they were. And they turned and started away. And I followed them through the fog. Down past the suburban station. Down the hill to the pier. Down across the boardwalk. Down across the clinging, sticky, wet sand and the fog running its fingers through my hair. And under the pier, with the wet, spongy piling making hell's own high forest around me, this smell of dead things cast up from the sea and the, the waves reaching for me. They went on, and I followed. And the waves beat at my knees. And the undertow crunched at my waist. And I followed. And then I felt my breath being snatched from me. There was a long horror of seaweed across my face. And darkness. And the taste of salt. to Quiet Please, which is written and directed by Willis Cooper. The man who spoke to you was Ernest Chappell. And the girl was played by Charita Bauer. As usual, the music for Quiet Please is composed and played by Gene Carrasso. And now for a word about next week's Quiet Please, here is our writer-director, Willis Cooper. The music of Claude Debussy was the inspiration for next week's story, which, borrowing the composer's title, I have called La Fille aux Cheveux de Lens. The girl with the flaxen hair. If you like charming ghosts, you'll probably like her. And so, until next week at this same time, I am quietly yours, Ernest Chapel. Quiet, please, comes to you from New York. This is the mutual.